keep going. Let's take a look at the essentials now. The workflow of WLAN is divided into these four steps. APs online, WLAN service configuration distribution, STA's access, and the forwarding of service data. Next, on Monday, we will conduct WLAN-related experiments for everyone. It will also be based on these four steps for configuration. Let's first look at the AP coming online. Okay, good. The AP coming online involves several steps. Firstly, the first step, AP acquires an address. What it means for an AP to come online is to let the AC discover the AP and then establish a capwap tunnel, right? And this tunnel is layer three. My AC and AP both need addresses, right? They both need addresses. So for our AP, for these APS, what methods are there for it to obtain an address? It can be manually configured statically, but this method is not usually used. Instead, it adopts DHCP to get an address. Then the DHCP server can be a separate server, acting as a DHCP server. Or our switches can act as the DHCP server. Even our AC can act as the DHCP server. All are possible. Anyway, just so long as the AP has an address, because once you have an address, you can then establish a CAPWAP tunnel with my AC. Right, that's the idea. Understand? This is the first step. AP needs to get an address as a prerequisite. Then once it has an address, AP discovers AC to establish a CAPWAP tunnel. How can AP know who the AC is? Right, how does it know who the AC is? You can manually specify the AC's address, for example, 1.1.1.1 to establish a capwap tunnel with AC, no problem. Then it can also be done dynamically through DHCP. For example, AC acts as the DHCP server to assign an address to your AP. Once the AP has an address, it will automatically establish a tunnel with AC. Yes, once the AP has an address, it will automatically go and establish a tunnel. Usually the second dynamic method is used. Understand? Yes. Usually the dynamic method is used. This is the second step. This is the second step, pretty simple, right? There are some deeper details, these things. I think there's no need for us all to master them. No need to master them. Once mastered, you will forget and won't remember. We must learn the framework, especially at the IE stage. In the IP theory stage, we need to capture packets, right? We need to study protocols, need to study the fields in packets, going into great detail. But at the IE stage, we need to grasp frameworks. Just like when we're learning, we must do an overall detailed and overall approach, right? In the AA level courses overall, we need to know what we're learning in, what stages of network learning. Need to learn some things, need to learn some protocols, like OSPF and ACS for you. But these introductions are rather superficial, right? Then at the IP level courses, it gets very detailed, delving deeply into each protocol to introduce them to you, like showing you packet captures, right? Then explaining the protocols, explaining the packet flow. This is what IP does. Then at the IE, it's back to the overview. This is what IP does. And then you're at a higher perspective after you've mastered all these foundational theories, right, then standing at a higher viewpoint to review the knowledge you've learned. At this point, your sense of achievement is different. Yeah, at this time, your feeling of gain is different. Yes. So, at the IE stage, we need to change our way of thinking about learning. This is the second step, right? This is the second step, right? The IP then establishes a capwalk tunnel to the AC. The third step is AP access control. All right, I need to talk about this part. I need to talk about this part. Let's start anew. ESP, the access control of the AP, assume your network has an AC, has an AC, right? And also has an AP, connect it. Say your AC, it has an interface, say interface, interface 100, right? Address 1.1.1.1, 1.1.1.1 slash 24 acting as DHCP server, assigning an address to AP. AP then gets an address, say from the same subnet 1.1.1.1 or something similar. Then, with the address in hand, knowing who the AC is, AP establishes a capwap tunnel with AC. Okay, good. Keep going. Um, what is access control? It's quite simple. 
Assume any AP connecting to my network will get an address in the 1.1.1.0 network and will establish a CAPWAP tunnel with the AC. So how do I ensure the legitimacy of these APs, right? It's not just any AP that a user might privately connect. I need to authenticate the access of your AP, right? AC has three ways to authenticate an AP. Authenticate based on the AP's MAC address, based on the serial number, or not authenticate at all. By default, it's done based on the MAC address. Yeah, by default, it's done based on the MAC address. Before my AP can establish a CAPWAP tunnel with the AC, you need to collect the AP's MAC address beforehand, right? You do this, say, through data SPP, right? On this AP, just check what its MAC address is, what's called its VSS ID, right? We talked about VSS ID in the first half of the class. Collect its MAC address. It's easy to collect, right? Yeah, it's easy to collect. Then on this AC, add the AP's MAC address to my whitelist, all done manually. The whitelist, all right, the whitelist. Um, this method, we call it offline importing of AP. Hey, this method, we call it offline importing of AP. You, the administrator, check the AP's MAC address. Hey, or maybe it's serial number. What's the SNR? Uh, import the relevant information beforehand. Before the AP comes online, import it into the AC's whitelist. Then, when the AP joins the network, uh, and also gets an address, I discover, uh, this device, AC, discovers, I've stored your AP's related information. Then can I establish a good CAPWAP tunnel with you? Of course, it can be established. Understand? That's the routine. That's the routine. Of course, there's also what's called no authentication by default. It authenticates through the MAC address. Uh, you need to import the AP's MAC address into this AC device beforehand. If I opt for serial number authentication, you'll need to collect the AP's serial number beforehand, import it into this AC device beforehand. Understand? Otherwise, the tunnel can't be established. If there's no authentication, it's easy to understand. All APs entering this network. Hey, all APs, right? Can get an address. That's how it works. Of course, there's also what's called no authentication. By default, it authenticates using the MAC address. You need to preload the AP's MAC address into the AC device. If I opt for serial number authentication, you'll need to collect the AP's serial number in advance and preload it into the AC device, understand? Otherwise, the tunnel cannot be established. If there's no authentication, it's easy to understand. It means all APs connecting to this network. Yes, all APs can obtain an address. All can establish a CAPWAP tunnel with the AC. That's the idea. This is what's called AP access control. AP access control, I need to ensure the legitimacy of your AP. Then we reach the fourth step. We've reached the fourth step which is the optional upgrade of the AP's firmware. For instance, I configure on the AC, hoping that when these APs connect, they will run version 22 of the operating system. So if your AP, before it goes online, before it connects, before it establishes a CAPWAP tunnel is running version 21, once the tunnel is established, right, your AP will automatically upgrade its operating system. You get what I mean? it will upgrade automatically. Okay, it's optional, can be configured or not. Then finally, it's about maintaining the CAPWAP tunnel. Once your tunnel is established, I need to ensure the connectivity of this tunnel, right? I must ensure the connectivity of the tunnel because I can see the status of all these APs on my AC. For instance, if your network had three APs exposed, whether these APs are offline or not, right? Whether these APs are faulty or not, I can see all this on the AC. So what can I use to manage these APs? It's through the CAPWAP tunnel. So I need to periodically send some packets within this tunnel, like some keep alive packets, deep live packets, right? To maintain the connectivity of the tunnel and thus monitor the status of these APs. Also, my configurations are all done on the AC and sent through the CAPWAP tunnel. So this tunnel has two main functions. First, to monitor the status of the AP, ensure the AP is okay, right? If any AP turns off or has a fault, I can sense it in time. The second function is for issuing service configurations. All configurations are done on the AC, and the AC pushes the configurations to these APS. 
This is the second function of the CAPWAP tunnel. And the third function, my CAPWAP tunnel, can also forward user traffic. You understand, it can also forward user traffic. So these are the three functions. Okay, let's continue. This is the AP going online, right? Then let's look at the issuance of WLAN service configuration. This is quite simple, actually. I've already explained it to everyone. After the AP comes online, right? After the AP comes online, then the AC performs centralized management and issues service configurations. For example, what SSID your APs are broadcasting, what channels they are using, how wide the channels are, these related configurations. I don't need to configure each individually. Everything is configured centrally uh, on the AC and these business configurations are then sent to each AP. You understand this is the issuance of service configurations. The second step is completed. The second step is quite simple, right? Everything is configured centrally on the AC. These service configurations are then distributed to each AP. You get it, right? This is the distribution of service configurations. And that completes the second step. The second step is relatively simple, isn't it?